When you first install Formidable Forms, it comes with a comment form. It's a nice, simple form that does an excellent job of showing off some of the settings and field types. So we're going to use that so that I can show you how they work. Right here on the main page for Formidable, you can see there's the form. When you hover, you can edit, go to settings. You can duplicate the form, which is really great. Because if you have a form that you like, but you want to make just a few changes and have a second one, you don't have to recreate the whole thing. And you can trash it, and you can do a preview. You can see here how many entries there are. Zero so far. Here's the key, contact form. And then here's a short code to embed that form and when it was created. Let's click on edit, and we'll show you a few things. Here's our form on the right. On the left are the field types that are available with the free version. Down below are the field types that are available with Pro, and you can see them, but you can't use them with the free version. So there's some advanced fields, and then there are some pricing fields down here at the bottom. Let's take a look at some of the field settings here. This is a standard text field. The asterisk means that it is required. Over here on the right, when you hover, you can see the ID of the field. You can duplicate the field. You could delete the field. And then with this little grabber, you could reorder the fields if you wish. I'll put it back because I like it up there. If you click on it, we switch to field options here on the left. So here's the field label. Here's the checkbox for required. If you uncheck it, you can see the asterisk goes away and there's a, a validation messages section here that appears when it is set. The CSS layout classes allow you to do some simple layout things with forms. This one indicates that it is the first in the form and that it's using half of the form. Now it doesn't show half here, but on the page itself, it will render. And you can click these three dots to see what your other options are. So you could set some fields to be these widths. And then here are some other options. There's first, right, first grid row, odd grid row, capitalize, etc. There's a, a validation messages section here at first because it's nice and short. You may recall in global settings that we could set what an error message would be. Well, this allows you to override that. Under advanced, we can set a default value. With pro, you can do a calculation or a lookup field, which means as you type, it looks something up somewhere else. If you click the three dots, you can see there are a variety of smart default values that you can choose with pro. So if I type something here, It appears here as text. So in the form, once it's on the front end of the site, I would have to remove this text in order to start typing. Now a difference with placeholder text is that it's semi-transparent, it's light gray, and you don't have to remove it before you can start typing. As soon as you click, it just disappears and you start typing. So I prefer placeholder text, but it's up to you what you want. There's a field description, which appears right below it. It says first. You can put as much as you want here. You can put it on a sentence or even a paragraph. Here's field size. I don't recommend using this if you are using layout classes to set the size. Um, choose one or the other. But if you don't want layout classes, then you can set a field size with percent, pixels, or Ms. So for example, if you are making a password field and you know your database can only hold 32 characters, you could set this to 32, and when they reach 32, they can't type anymore. Here you can choose format, and you can use input masks. So you can say it can only hold numbers, or only letters, or only alphanumeric, etc. Here's the required field indicator. Right now it's an asterisk. You can make it anything you want. Label position. Right now it is the default, which is top, but you can set it to the left, the right, inline without a set width, none, so that it's just not there at all, hidden so that it's it leaves the space, or you could set it as a placeholder inside the field. 
So you remember the placeholder text here, we could move name right inside the field. I'm going to leave that the way it is. Next is a field key. This simply needs to be a unique identifier for this field. It can be anything as long as it's unique. Usually you don't need to mess with it at all. I recommend just leaving it alone. And then there's field type. Right now it's text. You could change it to paragraph or number, email, website, URL, or phone or hidden. Um, with pro, you can do things like rich text or time tags, etc. So those are the field options for a text field. This one looks like a text field, but it's actually called an email field. If we go over to add fields, you can see here's an email option. Most everything is the same. There's required, there's the layout classes. If we go to advanced, there's default value, etc. But right here, you can change the field type. And again, you can change the validation message. Now, the difference between an email field and a text field is that the email field must hold an email address. It can't just be random text. So next, I want to show you the settings for this form. We've managed all the fields, but then we're going to click leave and not save any of those changes that I made. Now there are some decisions to be made about this form. Every form has a title and a description, and you can choose to have those show on the front end of the page or not. If not, then you could write your own title and description or not have one at all. There's the form key, which must be unique. Uh, again, it doesn't really appear anywhere. I don't recommend changing it. It's not worth, it's not worth doing. Here are the embed short codes just for the form. Then with the form and the title and description, you can optionally also insert with PHP. So if you want to embed it right in a template and hard code it, you can do that. Here's what happens when you submit. Right now, it shows a message. You can optionally redirect to a URL, so it goes to another page, or you can show some page content. By default, the form disappears once it's submitted and the result message appears. You can choose to keep the form there and have the message just appear right above it. And then by default, when you submit a form, it stores entries in the database. You can choose here not to do that. We're going to show you a little bit later how to send an email. So if you want only email and not store it in the database, you can do that as well. Here we have some Ajax options. Ajax means that your website is working dynamically with JavaScript. You can load and save the form builder page with Ajax, and you can validate this form with JavaScript. Usually is a lot faster. It makes it so that you don't have to reload the page to have PHP validate. So I'm going to choose that actually. And then here's the message. And again, this is something we set in the global settings, but here you can override that for just this form. So I'm going to click update just to save my JavaScript setting. Then we have actions and notifications. In the free version, the only action and notification you can choose is to send an email. If you have the pro version, there are a variety of others, and we'll look at more of those once we get the pro version installed. We have an email notification set up by default. It is turned on. You can duplicate or trash it. I typically like two email notifications, one that comes to me saying that Somebody filled out my form, but then one that also goes to the submitter and lets them know that we got their message and confirms that they filled it out properly. So if I click it, you can see here it, it needs a name, but then there's two. And if you click these three dots, you can have some options about who it goes, gets sent to. The admin email is the uh, admin email for the entire site. So that would be under settings general. So it's the site owner. You could type in your own address here. You can put anything in there you want. As for from right now, it's holding site name and then admin email. So it's sort of like coming from yourself. I prefer to have it come from the person who filled out the form. So I'm going to delete all of that. 
And then under the three dots here, I'm going to choose name space last. So it has their first name and their last name. And then in parentheses, or not parentheses, I'm sorry. And then in angle brackets, I'm going to choose the email address from the form. And there we are. Now the reply to is just the email address. Since I have the from holding the email address, I don't really need the reply to, so I could delete it. Over here on the right, you can choose to add a CC or BCC and a reply to. There's a subject, and right now it just says email from my formidable site. You can make it say anything you want. You can include the fields if you wish. And then the message has a short code here for default message, which includes all the information, and it's fairly attractive. So unless you really need to change something, I recommend just leaving it a default message. But you could delete this and reformat the entire message using all of your custom fields here. You can choose to append the IP address, browser, and referring URL to the message. And you can optionally send the emails in plain text. If you have the pro version, you can do attachments, conditional logic, and set up some automation. We're going to end this video here. And in the next one, I will show you how the entries system works for the contact form.